Well, if you find yourself on the streets of any city in the world, you will most certainly see a food delivery rider whizzing past you. And if you find yourself in London, Abu Dhabi or Hong Kong, you can be sure to see a delivery rider racing to fulfill a mission. The mission to satisfy consumer cravings within 30 minutes, be it breakfast or lunch, as the hyperlocal delivery company rides to take a big bite of the global online food delivery market, which is estimated to double in size to $1.4 trillion by 2027. Speeding with the pandemic thrust in the last quarter of 2022 alone, Deliveroo made 75 million food and grocery deliveries across 10 countries. But the uncertainty about growth of online food delivery post the pandemic growth and many macro headwinds arriving all at once have forced Deliveroo to take a hard look at its cost base, much like most other delivery platforms. As they now race to deliver profits, cut to 2023, stringent cost controls, exit from lackluster markets and even job cuts in the push for stronger unit economics have helped Deliveroo achieve break-even, taking it a step closer to profitability ahead of its earlier guidance. Well, joining me now on the show to talk about the food delivery market and uh, their plans for India is the co-founder and CEO of Deliveroo, Will Shu. He's on his maiden visit to Deliveroo's India Development Centre, for which the company does have big plans. Will, many thanks for joining us here uh, on Young Turks on CNBC TV 18. Your first visit to India, uh, and I want to understand from you why Deliveroo isn't in India. Uh, does it not seem like an exciting enough market for you, or do you believe that it's already got two large incumbent players and hence no space for a third? I think it's an amazing market, and I wish when I started this business 10 years ago that, you know, I could have gotten into India early, but, you know, that didn't happen, and you've got two big players, two players I respect um, hugely, and, um, you know, we're focused on building our, our Indian Development Center here, but not focused on um, actually launching the business here. Uh, yes, yeah, so no delivery uh, in India, but you did talk about your development center, which I understand is your largest facility, your largest development center outside of the headquarters in London. Will, take me through what the plan is as far as the development center here in India is concerned. Well, we kicked off um, about a year ago. So we hired our first people here in Feb 22. Um, the team here and the team in London have done an incredible job growing the team now to about 125 um, engineers and, and developers, and we'll be looking to increase that um, over the course of, of 23 as well. The talent that we've come across here um, is, 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 is really tremendous, and we're also working with people that have helped build these centers uh, before in the past. So um, really, really excited about it. Well, you know, speaking of uh, of the excitement, let's also talk about the food delivery market in general. Uh, and I want to understand from you what the big challenges are as you see the market and the landscape today. You've got inflation, which is biting into the spending power of consumers. Uh, you've got high interest rates, which is impacting businesses across the world at this point in time. And uh, companies like yours are now being forced to focus on profitability and look at free cash flow in a manner that was never done previously. And that's forcing many founders like you to review, reassess, reevaluate, and change plans. Will, how hard have the last few months been? I, I think it's, um, you know, I've been doing this 10 years, um, and, you know, you're always going to have different ups and downs um, in the business. But I think what's been happening over the last few years um, in terms of this, you know, COVID bump for a lot of tech companies, um, then following um, that um, sort of, you know, maybe maybe the growth coming from, from COVID tailwinds not persisting as long as we would have thought, you then toss in, uh, you know, a very high inflation environment in the UK and Europe, um, and, 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 and obviously interest rates rising and and investors wanting to see um, profitability sooner than they did in the past. All of this um, kind of coming together has meant that we've been um, hyper-focused on uh, financial discipline, making sure that we're um, being as efficient as possible, not just for, you know, um, currently, but, but going forward. And I do think it's the right thing to do um, for the company, for the industry. And it's not just the delivery industry. I think it's the, um, it's, it's most tech companies, right? And, and so we view this as an opportunity to 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 really rethink the way we're doing things, um, to, to get leaner um, and to generate um, cash faster than we would have thought maybe a few years ago. And we view that as an opportunity. 
Yeah, you know, you speak about uh, viewing this as an opportunity, uh, and that very often uh, is, is what happens during uh, adversity. You are pushed against the wall and you have no choice uh, but to reimagine workflow and business plans. But Will, you know, you said that this is the right thing to do. But as, as this rebalancing and this correction takes place, uh, you know, what do you believe is, is how much more pain are we likely to see for this ecosystem uh, globally as well as here in India? And I know that many founders here in India are grappling with exactly the same issues and the same challenges. But, you know, what kind of pain do you anticipate and how long do you believe this correction is going to last as this rebalancing takes place? I mean, I think there's two, we're, we're talking about two different things at once, right? I think the first one is purely a macroeconomic um, condition, right? And so do I think that inflation is going to last as, 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 as it will persist as, as, as at higher rate as it has been for, you know, post the next 12 months? Hard for me to say, but I'm, I'm willing to take a guess that it probably, you know, comes down at some point, right? And obviously, it's not like every market in the world is affected the same way, but certainly in the UK and Europe, we've seen it most pronounced. Then I think there's the second question, and in a way they're sort of related, but in a way they're not, which is, you know, the focus on profitability uh, versus something like growth. And I think what persisted in a ultra long, low interest rate environment, that probably won't come back for some time. Um, I don't think that switch mm. uh, flips back. I think that Investor focus will be on free cash flow generation, will be on efficiency. Um, all of the stuff that, frankly, people have been focused on since um, since the formation of capitalism, right? And so I think that that is come, that that has come back and that will persist in my view. But those two things are, are a bit different in my mind. Yes, uh, you know, linked but different. But Will, you know, what is that going to mean as far as individual businesses are concerned? And let's focus on your plans, for instance. I would imagine that uh, expansion will be put on hold. You're looking at exiting markets. You've already exited two uh, in 2022. Are you likely to take a hard call on markets that are not delivering for you uh, at this point in time? Well, we made that hard decision to, to, to exit two markets last year. Um, and that, that was really tough because we'd been in there for some time. But at the same time, we also entered a market, right? We entered Qatar. Um, we have a really great business in, in, in the Gulf states. We, we, we launched the UAE a while back in Kuwait a couple years ago. We've had a lot of success there. And on the back of that, the team launched Qatar. We are going to invest um, in the business because this, at the end of the day, is a growth industry. It's still a nascent industry. Penetration rates are still low. And, and so, if we are presented with opportunities to invest, we will. It's just the bar for those is much higher than it was in the past. Um, and a lot of our focus mm. will be, how can we be doing the things that we're doing day to day today even better in the future, right? So I think, um, I think, I think the, the, the investment opportunities will be there. But like I said, the bar just has to be higher. Yeah, you know, speaking of investment opportunities uh, and uh, the focus on efficiency, and one uh, is, of course, addressing the cost side, so taking out any bloat across the system at this point in time, and I know that that is uh, what all founders today are focused on. But what about... Uh, diversification of revenue streams will, and largely at this point in time, as far as the food delivery business is concerned, uh, you know, it's restaurant commissions, it's customer delivery charges, uh, it's the tips over and above, uh, you know, what, what you already charge your customers. Then, of course, there is the ad space. You know, what, what do you believe could be added to the mix in terms of possible revenue streams for the food delivery well, business? Yeah, I, I would say that um, every single year we come up with new, um, large, you know, revenue stream ideas that we're testing out. So I'd say the big one over the last few years has been grocery, right? Grocery is a huge part of our business now, much more, much more than I thought it would be at the beginning of COVID. And we're doing grocery deliveries in kind of anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, working with an assortment of brands you already know. Uh, but also building our own dark stores in conjunction with those brands, right? So that's been a huge area of growth for us. Um, I think you mentioned the ads business. Um, we launched our ads business last year uh, for restaurants, and late in the year, we launched an ad platform for FMCG um, companies as well. So, you know, the likes of, you know, Unilever companies like that. 
Um, and, and we've also launched a number of non-food um, delivery partnerships as well. We've got a big, big partnership with Boots in the, in the UK. And so I think that, you know, your question's a really good one, um, but, you know, I think every year we've shown that, you know, we've come out with new initiatives that are adding um, to the top line. And like I said, the bar is, 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 is ultimately even higher now than it was in the past for, for, for adding new things to what we do. You know, and, and while I hear you, Will, uh, uh, you know, I, I look at what's happening here in India with the two large incumbents in this space, and they're going down exactly the same road, uh, you know, grocery del deliveries, and of course now quick commerce, 10-minute deliveries. What do you make of the 10-minute delivery model? I think it can work um, in areas where there's high population density and where we have um, strong market share. I think in areas like that, um, you can push enough density to make money within the four walls of, 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 of the dark store. It's not an easy business at all. Um, I view it as a pretty critical part of the consumer value proposition, though, and we have made it work profitably within the four walls. I also think it's a very different time than it was, let's say, two, uh, two years ago, 18 months ago, when dark store players were raising capital at you know, really, really high valuations, um, huge amounts of capital very quickly. That has changed uh, pretty dramatically. Um, and so, you know, we've been able to um, 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 do the things that we want in that space uh, without, you know, people, you know, acting, I, I, would, I would say, um, as, 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 I don't want to say irrational, because maybe what worked back then was rational, but in a, in a much, people have been much less aggressive, I would say, in this space as capital has dried up. And our belief is that this dark store model works on a platform where you already have the lowest cost deliveries and you already have the customers at the same time. Hmm. Uh, so do you believe then, especially if you do have high penetration and high density and enough dark stores, uh, do you believe that then this 10 minute quick uh, commerce model is viable uh, in the long term, is it sustainable in the long term? I think it's viable in certain neighborhoods and areas. I don't think it's viable in every single neighborhood around the world. I don't see a situation where this supplants, you know, our normal grocery delivery where we already work with existing stores, right? I think it's a complement um, and in areas where we think the unit economics work, um, we're definitely investing in it and that's what we've done. But I don't, I don't view this as a necessarily, a, you know, you, you'll be dark store in every corner of the world. Right. Uh, uh, Will, uh, you know, one of the challenges that I know the Indian players are faced with, and I wanted to understand uh, uh, your take on this, is the uh, partnership with restaurants. At the end of the day, it, it, is, it has to be a partnership, but restaurants often feel that the delivery aggregators uh, are not doing enough uh, to make this a mutually beneficial relationship. And I know that the Indian incumbents are faced with that. I wanted to understand your perspective on dealing with this and how you've gone about it in the last decade. I mean, it just has to be a partnership at the end of the day, right? Um, I think what we bring to merchants, and it's not just restaurants, but uh, you know, grocers as well as you know non-food merchants is incremental sales, um, and, and I think one of the, the the criticisms of the space is that we charge what seems on paper to be potentially you know a, a hefty commission. But I think the difference between our business and a traditional marketplace is we are actually fulfilling the delivery, right? We we are paying the delivery riders, um, and they need to make um, a, a good living as well, and so. Um, sort of sitting down with restaurants, explaining the incremental impact of the business, explaining you know how much we're investing, not just in the delivery side, but the payment side, the fraud side, the packaging side, the customer care side, all of these things that may not be obvious you know um, um, on any given order, but are critical. And obviously all the software behind handling all, the, all of those things and balancing the three sides of the marketplace. So all of that stuff is, is, is really, really important. Um, and then we do other stuff for restaurants, right? We, we work with them in dark kitchens, right? Um, we have a white label delivery service for them as well. So you can order through their own, their own app or their own website as well. Um, and we obviously collaborate a lot on marketing. Um, but, you know, you have to balance all three sides. And sometimes it takes a little bit of um, education. But at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. It has to be partnership.
Well, time for us to take a break, but when we return, we continue our conversation with Bill Shu, the founder of global food tech delivery company Deliveroo. Let's you in 